Welcome everyone. As you might notice, we are not Tess and John. They are right now enjoying their well-deserved winter break. In the meantime, we give our best to replace them as the hosts of the micro moment. We, this is Desha and me, Florian. Regular listeners of the micro moment will already know us as we've already been guests on the last episode of 2021. For those who have not listened to this episode, which you definitely should, we would like to briefly introduce ourselves. Disha, you go first. Hi, everyone. I am Disha, and I'm doing my PhD in infection biology. I am particularly interested in the evolution of live vaccines, especially diseases caused by salmonella. Cool. And I am Florian, and I am doing my PhD in bioscience engineering at the University of Leuven in Belgium and trying to make beer better. There is a certain protein that can cause a tremendous overforming of beer. As a consumer, you might not have noticed this a lot because, of course, breweries have quality controls. But for the brewing industry, this so-called gushing is a big problem. And I'm soon coming up with a solution to detect this evil protein and then save a lot of money and a lot of malt, which would otherwise be wasted. That's my mission. And for today, our mission on this podcast is to interview four fabulous people. And the reason for this is that we are all part of a microbiology blog called microbytes.org. Please visit it, uh, which will end of this month turn one year old. And this is definitely a time to celebrate. And therefore, we are joined today by Tanin, Anais, Clemence, and Charlotte who are the four founders of the Microbytes blog and will now explain more about how this happened, how they had the ID. And first of all, they will introduce a little bit themselves and Disha will now get on closer with them. So, uh, founders, let's start with uh, your introduction. Who are you? What is your micro movement? And what was the spark that started you on a microbiology journey? Anais, do you want to start? Sure. So I'm also a PhD student at uh, the KU Leuven in Belgium, like Florian. And my project is about gut uh, microbiota community. So I study the microbes in the gut in my test tubes. And my microbe moment, I'm not sure I really have one, but I, I'm really fascinated by all the microbes, let's say. And every time I learn new things about them, especially with the blog now, with all those different stories that are coming in. It's it's always really wonderful to to know more about what they can do and, and who they are. But I'm I'm really fascinated about microbiology. It's been some years now. I think the first thing was maybe doing the, the bachelor when we were doing the, the practicals in microbiology. And actually we made some beer, Florian, that would <laughs> that would speak to you. We made some beer in like the second year, and that was that was really cool. I was like, okay, this this is something I I, I could see myself doing, you know. Of course, if beer is involved, exactly. That's always the point where it starts. <laughs> yes. Tanin. Hi, I'm Tanin. Well, I'm a PhD student in the same lab as Anais, except for my focus is to look at a particular profile that has been associated with inflammation. And by profile, I mean a microbial profile, because what else would it be? And I try to understand its composition in the context of inflammatory chronic diseases. And I actually spoke on Tessa's podcast a few months ago. And I believe I recounted the story of my first encounter with the field of microbiome specifically, not just microbiology, about a really irascible guest who was trying to convince me not to eat dessert because the simple sugars would have led to the propagation of what he dubbed bad bacteria and ultimately my premature demise. So that was kind of um, my inspiration to start understanding why someone is trying to deny me dessert. Um, but uh, or originally, I always loved microbiology as a child. And uh, I was a bit guilty of growing interesting things with my siblings, much to the disappointment of my parents. And I guess that's that started my microbiology journey. 
that's quite a story a dark one but interesting charlotte yes so i'm also a phd student at the kai leuven and me and clemence we work close with anais and tain we're in the same corridor but we're at a different lab and we're more interested in well i am more interested in bacterial ecology of the gut bacteria and what i do is i grow them in a test tube or a small bioreactor and i see what happens to my small bacterial community over time and also what they are doing when they are poked a little so if i make the environment a bit nasty for them how are they growing and will they grow as plants which is kind of interesting to see and for my microbe moment to be honest i didn't know too much about microbes until i started studying biology when i was like 19 or something i wanted first to work with monkeys and apes and look at their behavior i was really a classical biologist looking at all the the big things in life like trees and birds and we had a mandatory course microbiology at our university and then we started doing genetic manipulations of e coli and i can specifically remember doing a blue white screening of e coli so we had to alter their dna and it, i don't know it was just so fascinating to see that what i did in a test tube had effect on these little microbes that were growing yeah i don't know i and from then on i just focused on bacteria and now i'm combining actually both the ecology and the bacteria things that i like by by my work now so yeah kind of happy to talk about that too brilliant clemens So as Charlotte say I'm also working in her lab I'm a PhD student but I'm doing bioinformatics so what I do is developing tools like informatic tools to predict what's going on in the biology and especially following bacteria in a community to see how many how I how they the grows in the media and also uh, work on uh, predicting the interaction between bacteria to see how they interact and uh i started biology quite young i i wanted to go in the labs and that my 16 i start to um, to do some uh, microbiology and i think i really liked to see microbes uh moving under the microscopes and like staining the bacteria and making them grow was like cooking for me like you have to follow the recipe and i like that quite a lot so i continue for years and years and i quit a bit the, all the experiment of things to focus more in the informatics but really like to follow what's going on in microbiology still so you must be good at baking <laughs> yeah i hope so <laughs> i guess yeah. she really is it's sometimes and they're phenomenal Thank you, thank you. <laughs> so, tell me about your career plans. Can we go to the next question? <laughs> <laughs> no, I I'm not sure what I want to do after my PhD. So, although I'm almost finishing, I'm still uh, not sure about the next steps. Well, science communication is always in the pipeline because you have Oh yeah, of course. microbes. Of course, this is very interesting. I really like science communication. Yeah. Yeah, for me I would love to combine science communication and research depending on the topic I'm researching it's either interesting to the broad public or not so yeah sometimes you have to collaborate like like we're doing now with microbytes to talk about different stories from different people and and get a better scope of what's happening in research but yeah I, I would love to do that in the future as well and and try and incorporate that also in my work if possible uh for myself i'm hesitating between two things so i first wanted to be a translator between biologist and informatician so they can understand what where the need for the biologist and the second thing is i really like to teach so it's kind of science communication but for for students and uh, i think i will try to do both in my life if i can and uh for me i'm not so clear as to what i want to do however um i'm trying to 
incorporate science communication um, always if it's my main pro profession that would be great if it's a side project um, that would also be great because as you have noticed in the past year or two with this pandemic that knowledge of microbiology and science in general is quite limited in the public I was also thinking about possibly working in industry, but lately I've also considered working in a governmental organization to help increase scientific awareness in government and to manage outbreaks or looking at disease cohorts. That's some interesting plan. And of course, as the story of most PhD students is that they don't know what they are going to do later on. So let's move on to some fun questions. Uh, do you have a favorite microbe-inspired drink or food? Well, so I think because I'm French and I can say the same, uh, we have to say that we love food. Uh, we, love, uh, we love cheese, sorry. So I think it may be cheese. But when we think of it, we also think of wine. So yeah, wine also, it's one of the things that we like a lot. But now that we moved in Belgium... <laughs> There's a lot of beer, so it's difficult to choose only one. So if you agree, can we select several of them? I think wine and cheese go very well together. So that's probably the perfect choice together with the beer. Three wonderful things that are made by fermentation. Indeed, yeah. I just love Greek yogurt. I eat it for breakfast. I can eat it as a snack. I can eat it uh, after dinner or incorporate it into my dinner. So. Yeah, Greek yogurt uh, for me. Um, I love yogurt, but I think I love all fermented foods except for sauerkraut. I think, is that even fermented? I'm not sure, but uh, that's like the only food that I, I cannot stand. Like it just, I just, but that's it. But everything else I adore and I will guzzle it up. Anything pickled, anything tangy, acidic, sour, I love it. Yeah, all, like most fermented food are just really good like we're so lucky microbes can uh, can make all that i think thank you for this introduction and how you get in love with microbiology and all our favorite tiny microbes and yeah you're so much in love with it that you even decided to start a blog about microbiology about microbes and it's called microbytes.org I will paraphrase a little bit what the, what the blog does. It takes individual scientific articles published in scientific journals and breaks it down into digestible pieces for a general audience. And I think that's, that's a wonderful thing to do. Right now, we have 64 of these articles on the website in English language, and other languages are growing. But before we go deeper into the success of microbytes, Where did the initiative or the ideas come from to start this blog? Yeah, so it started with me, um, basically. So during my PhD, I thought I should do a bit more. Like I felt a bit in, you know, the scientific bubble and I missed giving back to society, let's say. So I thought I should do a bit more. So I started looking online at the different initiatives that were already out there. And the first one I encountered was actually Papier Maché, which is a French blog. Uh, they, they do what, what we do, but in all the different science fields. So everything together into one blog, which is also interesting. So I contacted them and actually I was about to start with them. But at the same time, I also saw Science Bites. And actually Science Bites is a network of uh, different bite sites. It started with Astrobytes in 2010. So more than 10 years ago, they now have more than 3,000 articles. They have a lot of writers uh, working for them. I think they have different languages as well in the podcast. Like it's, it's becoming also a big organization. And then in the next years, other bites started. So they have now, for example, ocean bites, immunobites, chemo bites, like uh, about different topics. What I saw is actually they didn't have anything about microbiology. So I contacted them because you can easily contact them on their website. And I got in touch with uh, Nathan, Nathan Sanders, which is one of the co-founders of Astrobytes and actually is there to help uh, grad students, mostly uh, PhD students, to start their own bite sites. So you're not working under them, you're just working with them. And it's like a big network of all the different sites uh, together. But 
Microbyte is is us. And we were just managing it, but they they were there to help uh, mostly at the beginning. So when I talked with him, he was like, "Okay, well, it's good. You really motivated, enthusiastic. All you need now is a team of three to five people, because you can't do this by yourself." And directly, I thought of the three other names that are here today um, for different reasons. For example. Charlotte uh, did a master in science communication, so I knew she would be interested. Clemence, like she said before, is really uh, interested in teaching and education, and she has very good informatics skills, so I knew she could be an asset for the website. And Tanine was already doing some science communication. She was already on Print of Science Belgium, and she did other things before as well. So I I thought that was the dream team and they all said yes right away. So I'm, I'm really, really happy that they did. That's really cool. And I think that's something not every PhD student would think about during a PhD. I mean, it's a huge commitment to start such a project and it, sure. it, really, it really shows a passion for science communication. And I think maybe we should talk a little bit more about what science communication is for you and why do you think is it so important for our society? Uh, of course, science communication, this word, this term is now everywhere, but how would you fill it with life? For me, uh, it's really trying to close the gap between what we do in the lab, so the, the science and, like I said, our small bubble of just academics and people. And you said not every PhD students think about doing that, and that's true. And I think for me, actually, the pandemic really pushed me there because we saw and we're still seeing this gap that feels very small sometimes and just so big all the times. And for me, that's that's it. It's just closing the gap. Charlotte, did you also want to answer the question? Yes, because as uh, Anais already said, I did a master's in science communication and there we covered a lot of topics. And what I saw was missing there is information about projects that are not really out there for the public to, to read about. Because most of the time, if you read about uh, microbes, it's either a very good thing that's happening, a breakthrough in, in medicine or, or something in the food industry, or it's a very bad thing. Like now we have this corona pandemic, or uh, if there's an E. coli outbreak somewhere uh, because food in the supermarket was spoiled. But there's not a lot of in-between stories. There's not a platform for researchers or for research groups to actually be excited about their own work, which at the moment might not have a big societal impact, but it can have a big impact on science itself and in the way how science is done, like developing methods or working with an organism that's not well known like the slime mold article on our website. Many people see it sometimes when they walk through the woods, but they don't know what it is or how it behaves. And they might be interested also in seeing those stories, but there's not a lot on the internet to, to find about these, these topics. Yeah, I think there's generally this tendency in, let's say, what is what could be called the mainstream journalism is to hype stuff and to look for the extremes. And indeed, what you just said, the middle grounds are completely blanked out, like the fundamental science. If there is not out of a sudden a pandemic, nobody today would know about uh, mRNA vaccines, for example. And I think a blog like this can help that there does not need to be a pandemic to learn about this super interesting things. Yeah, exactly. Speaking about creating a blog, of course, you see blogs everywhere on the internet. And sometimes you have the feeling everyone has their own blog. But maybe for people that are interested in starting one or just out of curiosity, how difficult was it from the idea that, that Anai said over gathering you people into this project until launching the website? How long did it take? How difficult was it technically? So I don't think we'll say to you that it was difficult to, to create it because we started and plan everything. So uh, we were quite organized and we shared the work since we had different expertise. We could work in different aspects of the blog and, and that helps us, uh, us a lot. 
Uh, so we started small and grew the project with time. So for that, we will keep it the same way. And yeah, so we, we had a lot of meetings at the beginning to be sure that we agree on what we wanted to do, what we wanted to say, that we will build the, the website as we wanted as well, seeing the, the good information, the good places, and share the information, share the article on other platforms as well, like uh, Twitter or Facebook. So uh, I think, yeah, we, we needed to be organized and, uh, and, and, and divide the, the work between uh, the four of us at the beginning before including other people. Yeah, and if I can add to what Clemence just said, is we started with the four of us. So we planned to do four articles a month, maybe two a month, depending on our, our own schedules. Um, and then we had the idea to ask everyone, basically, who visited the website by, by just having an option for them to contact us to see if they were interested in, in helping us. And I think within the year, we already are with like 40 different people doing different aspects of the website. So the expectations were low and then it just blossomed out from there. So yeah, we started small and uh, that helped us in, in making a structure for how it is at the moment. Did it actually surprise you to see that so many people are eager to contribute? Not at all. I think that there is always this universal desire to share exciting news, especially if you're a PhD student and you're specializing in it. You kind of also want to make sense of why you're interested in something by sharing great beats in it. So it's nice to see that there are people internationally reaching out to us who are just as enthusiastic and it just kind of confirms your, your belief that the topic is interesting, that there are people out there who see something and want to share it. Hmm. Would you say it also has to do with the fact that if you want to publish your work, your ideas in journals, you need to have a name and you need to go across the, the peer review for good reasons, of course? Well, we don't let people speak publicly without citing peer-reviewed articles. So it is a way for us to help discuss and debate what is out there and why we think it deserves merit. And also it can help us discuss what are some of the shortcomings of some of the peer-reviewed articles out there so that it kind of lessens the distance between the average reader and what is being circulated amongst experts. We do see a lot of news stories and people uh, from different organizations reporting huge beats in the scientific community, but something small that like the slime mold article that Charlotte was talking about could go unnoticed by these major news sources. And we want to give them also an opportunity to have some attention just because it was delightful for us to read. So I remember that I met Anais uh, during the World Microbe Forum online. And there I got to know about microbites and decided that I want to apply for this, to be a volunteer for microbites. What other ways did you guys use to, you know, attract writers apart from publishing it on the website that you have a contact form and please contact us or maybe having casual conversations on conferences like World Micro Forum? I think they're they're finding us somehow. Like uh, we're a bit on on social media, uh, obviously, like Twitter and, and Facebook mostly. But I'm not sure where people find us because some of uh, the contributors are people that we know or people that know people, and you know that the network is growing. But some people just seem to randomly find us. So I guess they've maybe you've been reading the blog and then at some point decide that they also want to volunteer. But yeah. I'm not sure, actually. Um, also, in my experience, for the people who help us translating, because that's not something we do on our own, those are mostly people we know and have met in real life because it's some commitment to be translating all the articles that, that we bring out. So it's good and important to have good communication there. And also, 
yeah, we just talk about microbytes with anyone who is who wants to listen. So it's a lot of mouth to mouth advertisement as well. And I think Florian, that's also how you joined us, right? Yeah, I was kind of headhunted by Tanine, I guess. She asked me if I wanted to join and of course I wanted to join. Now that we are speaking about the translation of the website, I've been browsing through the other Bytes projects, Science Bytes projects, and it seems that Microbytes is really outstanding when it comes to the translation of the website. I think we are now online with five different languages, six even, six, Charlotte just indicated six, six different languages, while English is normally considered as the language of science and the other Bytes projects seem to stick to this rule. Why, why did this happen? Why is Microbytes online in so many different languages? So I think it's twofold. So one, we live, all live in Belgium and Belgium is a trilingual country. So we speak Dutch, we have a big French part as well and a small part that speaks German. So for us, for me, I already spoke Dutch and Anaïs and uh, Clemence. They are French speakers. So it was an easy transition to make uh, the decision and do the website in three languages already. And also a big part of science communication is being available to the big public. And a lot of research, although it is in English, they use a lot of jargon. Also, some English words that come from microbiology are not well known. In, in, in the Dutch or French community. So for us, it was also important to convey the message in our own languages. Although the readers may prefer it in English, since for us, it's also easier to report in English. As you said, it's the major language of, of science. It's good to, to provide it at least to people. And I think yes. for the, the other bytes, it's mostly because they're based in the US. I don't think they, like for us, it was from the start, like like Charlotte said, it was really important for us to uh, do it in our own native language as well. And we're all speaking different languages. So it was, it was like a given for us. But for them, maybe from the US, it may seem less important. So would you say that what has been a benefit for the scientific community to have a shared language is actually a bad thing for science communication? That... People in, in all the different nations are missing out on a huge part of scientific progress because of this? I definitely would say so, because, um, for example, the pandemic right now, there was a John Oliver segment on his show last week tonight where they talk, were talking about misinformation regarding the virus. And though social media has several safeguards to minimize the spread of misinformation, they are unfortunately unable to filter all the misinformation in other languages. So you have a community that gets neglected by the larger scientific community just because they don't speak English. And therefore, you know, mistrust towards science or any of the issues that we're currently facing are being amplified just because of this language barrier. Mm. Clemence? Our public audience can be undergraduate students or uh, freshly graduated people that may not uh, have English as their first language and not uh, know the English uh, vocabulary for the science. Because, for instance, in French, in France, we learn uh, all this vocabulary in French. So giving the possibility to read the article in different languages was also putting this information accessible for people that would not be so used to read articles in English or get this information in English. I think especially the number of readers from so many different countries of microbytes is impressive. We have readers from 135 different countries all over the world, and probably not all of them speak English or are very confident in reading English. So I guess it, it really helps to have this information in so many different languages. So would you agree with me that then one of the shortcomings of, of science communication is a focus on, on English language or do you think science communication is already a part of other communities speaking other languages? I think in French, we also have quite a big science communication team. Like I, I think each 
language, at least maybe the, the biggest languages like Spanish or, or French or German. I'm, I'm sure there's already a lot out there. Maybe in numbers, maybe not as much as English, because also most people can speak English right over the world. Uh, so maybe there's more content, but I'm, I'm pretty sure there's a lot in other languages as well. Mm. I don't think it's so much that you don't have representation in each language. It's just a matter of that if it's being shared, it's usually being shared in English. And then the area and the language that you're trying to present the information in is dependent on what available resources exist. We're just trying to broaden our scope. As Clement says, that we want to also reach people who may not be comfortable with the scientific jargon in English. Speaking already about potential shortcomings of, of science communication, what would you say are still maybe undiscovered fields of science communication where where could SciCom still become better? For me, I think if we all look back to our school periods when we were kids, how often did you come in contact with science communication? I mean, we all did maths. We all learned a little bit about physics. We had the basic biology courses about the human body, about plant life. But how often did you actually come in contact with, for instance, the microbiology world? We could already start from quite a young age to, to teach children also that the small aspects of like life can make a huge impact on, on our daily life and what they can do for us. So for me, if I could choose to, to enhance one area of science communication, it would be to improve the curriculum of, of schools at a young age to already implement this and, and show them that microbes don't have to be bad. And of course, you should wash your hands, but... They also do a lot of good stuff for us. Yeah, that's actually a very good point. I already wanted to point it out when Clément said that he would like to be a teacher. Then I was already thinking, yes, actually, in school, this is where science communication should start, especially because almost everyone has to go to school. So this is really a, a point where everyone at least once in, in their lives could come in touch with science and not only what is written in textbooks for children. What do you think? How could we change how the system is working in the moment? You need children to, to do fun stuff. So I think combining small experiments with a very nice outcome or something unexpected or something big, something you can see. I think if you could show them or make them do experiments like that or something as simple as keeping a diary for your plants. You, you grow a small plant from, from seed to when it flowers. So they can just see what, what happens in, in the world or you make them do little physics experiments at home or make them actively think and work with, with science. That would be something that they will never forget. Yeah, we all learn by experience. Very true. <laughs> there's, a, there's a great initiative actually that is ongoing. I think it's a good time to mention it because it's it, exactly what they're trying to do. So we've been in contact with... Um, Kenneth uh, Timmis, he's um, a professor in the, in the UK, and uh, basically he's trying to gather microbiologists around the world to um, feel this uh, problem of, of literacy of microbiology in society by starting with schools. So they are doing some fact sheets about different topics in microbiology and then trying to uh, translate them in different languages and give that to teachers. And basically, it's uh, different topics that teachers can read and then extract information from and then teach to different ages. So uh, what they want to do is ask microbiologists to make those topics. So it can be very detailed, but easy to, to understand, of course. And then teachers can decide uh, what they do with it with their students. So, of course, if it's primary students or high school students, they will teach something different but they will have the same information and they can share that with their students. That's really an outstanding initiative. And I think this is the way it should go. And we are definitely still facing a lot of obstacles on our way for to a perfect science communication, if, if such a thing even exists. But with microbytes and, and our outreach, I think we are already covering a huge part of the way, probably. About the science communication that you guys have mentioned just now, 
I would say that along with the children, I think this approach is uh, very well suited for adult population as well. I think the universities are now trying these outreach programs wherein they are exactly doing the same thing, teaching the general population about microbiology. Of course, it is a bit sad to know that this is happening since the pandemic and not from before, but I think it's still a good start. Okay, so let's talk about diversity. Life sciences as a research field is still plagued by biases, for example, gender and color. What advice would you give to the current generation of students to reduce this bias when they progress in their careers and become leaders or entrepreneurs like you? If they don't have anyone in their inner circle that has a background in science, it is the duty of someone who is studying science is to be able to encourage people who are interested in it, even if it's a passing interest, and to encourage people, especially if they fail at such a difficult material. If any of us were to be set back because we had issues or difficulties with our own projects and experiments, we wouldn't be where we are today. Because one of the important tenets of science is perseverance, that you have to keep trying. And that if someone who doesn't have this kind of background or exposure is discouraged by it, in order to maintain diversity of thoughts and background, you need to encourage people to keep trying. I think there will always be struggles of biases and diversity. The important thing is to try to increase the transparency so that shady behavior is not cannot go through and then will not be successful. You will always have some form of adversity, but what you can do as someone who's an expert is to join in science communication, try to encourage people at all stages of their scientific pursuit and do your best to try to keep their interests. And if you see that there is a bias in terms of resource and opportunity, that you do whatever you can to try to fill that gap. How do you actually experience the the current situation? I mean, we just closed a period in time where science has been completely dominated by male people. I think that's changing now. But do you think the development is coming to an end and there is something that we could call equality already? Or do you think there are still huge inequalities in regard to gender, but also to color and representation of all different ethnicities in science. In the case of gender imbalance, I think with microbiology and biology in general, we are quite okay with the balance. For me, my biology uh, studies, we I think we were at around 50% male, 50% female. Um, but I don't know if it's the topic or the culture, but I love to see that more and more outreach encourages women to study that particular subject and also advertisements for those studies. They feature more women in, for instance, infographics. So they make women in that particular field more visible. So it would give someone maybe a bigger uh, idea to be to be part of that community as well if you see with your eyes that you won't be the only one. I agree with this, that in microbiology and biology in general, a lot more women are there and the ratio is quite okay. But when you talk about leadership positions, I see quite a huge imbalance Uh, do you also feel that? I feel it. I've seen it in a panel where we had members from different companies and uh, research institutions field questions from the audience. And in my year, it was mostly women who were students in the audience and all of the panelists were men. So you do see sometimes that there is still a bit of a generational divide that maybe we're on our way, but okay. we're still not quite there yet. I think in the bioinformatics field, so if you look at the 20 last years, I think, or maybe even less, like 10 last year, uh, because it's like an area that's new and it starts to grow a lot, there is more uh, demand that people that apply for that. And there is more possibility that there are less regarding of the gender 
and there is our color and things because we need uh, this uh, uh, a lot of people in this area. So I think I know more people like in the head of the department in bioinformatics that are uh, diverse than maybe in biology for that I don't know so much, but there is more position opening and more diversity accepted, I think, in new area like bioinformatics. Very interesting. I think that you guys are already idols for the next generation of PhD students to be <laughs> leaders or entrepreneurs. On this note, I would like to hand over to Florian. Yes, I think we are coming to an end of this podcast episode. So I would like to just spread a few more facts about microbytes. I've already mentioned that we have 64 articles in English language online. 18,000 people so far have visited the website from 135 countries all over the world. And the main topics that were covered are about bacteria, viruses, and food microbiology. I think not very surprising for a microbiology blog, but yet a very fascinating topics. And I think if you all go online on microbytes.org, you will definitely find something that sparks your interest and maybe keeps you entangled for a longer time on our blog, we would be very happy about this. That said, we would like to say goodbye to our guests of tonight. It was fantastic to have you here. Very interesting to hear about your personal thoughts and how microbytes came to life and what you think about science communication. Well, thanks for having us, especially uh, with our one-year anniversary. It's uh, very nice to be able to share it with, uh, with you. Bye-bye, guys. Bye. Bye. I want to thank Disha and Florian for hosting this week's episode of The Micro Moment. They did a fantastic job and can't wait to see them again on our next The Bomb. I highly suggest visiting Microbytes on their website, M-I-C-R-O-B-I-T-E-S dot org, where you can read more about the world of microbiology. You can even follow them on Twitter at underscore Microbytes. You can also find them on Facebook. The Micro Moment also has a blog about microbiology. You can check it out at microbiogals.com, where we post regularly. You can even follow us on Twitter at microbiogals. And thank you all to who listen. Because of you, we have reached several milestones, including 2,000 Twitter followers and over 5,000 downloads. We can't do this without you, and we hope that you continue to enjoy our show. As always, everyone, I hope you and your microbes are enjoying your symbiotic relationship, and we'll see you next time. Bye!